Amen and amen. We have the joy and the privilege this morning of beginning worship with two baptisms today. And we praise the Lord with these two men and that they have come to know him. And we're grateful for that. This is the perfect picture of who we are and what we do, that we come to the Lord as broken individuals in need of a savior. And he heals us and he saves us and we come up out of it in newness of life. And so we praise the Lord for that. And today we start with Vlad. Vlad, come on down. Yeah, come stand here. Vlad is, is new to First Baptist, but we're grateful to have him and grateful that we've been able to walk with him in faith and grateful to come to this, the day of his baptism. And so, Vlad, do you profess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? I do. I now pronounce you. No, I'm not pronouncing you. We're not getting married, are we? I was about to do the wedding ceremony. I now baptize you. I don't know if, there's, if we've got somebody to marry you to over here. but I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in death and raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Excuse me, I left my uh, wedding script at the house, so I'm going to have to come back for that. No, my name is Rick Henderson. I'm the associate pastor of students here at FBC San Antonio. It's a blessing to be a part of this time today. I'm bringing forward Stephen Chesborough, who gave his life to Christ over one of our retreats that we had in the last couple of weeks. We were at the beach, and we talked about wanting to do it there, but we wanted to be here because we want our friends and family to be a part. If you're a friend or family, would you please stand in honor of Stephen in this moment? Stephen, have you given your life to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? I do. And you will follow him the rest of your days? Yeah, I do. I baptize you, Stephen, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism. Raised to walk in newness of life. Come on. Good morning, church family. Welcome to worship. Hear the word of the Lord. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and not lose heart. Amen. Amen.
Praise with us, the God of grace. Have you come to praise the Lord this morning? You are not alone. Would you stand and just wave at those around you in the room? We are so grateful to have you with us today. Good morning to those on television. God bless you. We're so glad to have you in worship. Amen. Well, let me just tell you, if you want to get married, we do weddings here too. So we do, we do both. We do baptisms and weddings, and sometimes you get on the wrong script. All right? So we are, we are married unto the Lord. We are the bridegroom of Christ. So today is day 234 of this pandemic. Sunday number 34. And it's still pressing on. We pray to our Lord that he would intervene. And we wait upon him to do just that. Now, let me say, I do have a, just a couple of updates that I want to give you in this time today. Uh, normally, we would give you updates on Tuesday. But we want to go, go ahead and share about what we're going to do next week, this morning. So that all of you might hear on television and all of us in the room can hear together. Now, there's, there's a couple of changes that are going to happen next week. And these changes are kind of pressing us forward into phase four of our reopening. Um, but also, the, uh, much of it is coming from feedback from you. That many uh, on TV and, and many in the room have been giving us feedback and, and telling us what you hope for and what you're looking for. And so we're doing our best uh, to listen to the Lord and accommodate worship as best we can. And so there's a couple of changes that are going to happen next Sunday. Now, first, we have been doing our early service at 8 a.m. And there has been plenty of room to social distance at 8 a.m. And I've had many people tell me, Pastor, 8 a.m. is just too early. Uh, we can't get our kids up at 8 a.m. We can't get dressed. It's just, I'm still having my coffee at 8 a.m. So for you, we're moving it back to 8.30, which is where it was before the pandemic. So we're moving it back. So this week, you get an extra hour. Next week, you get an extra 30 minutes for that early morning worship service. So it will be 8.30. And, and one other change there at the 8.30 service. Um, a number of our senior adults um, have asked for this, that in 8.30, you will be required to wear masks throughout the entire service so that some of our senior adults can come and worship, that that's the only way they can be here. And so they're asking us to do that. Now, our normal policy right now, just so we're all on the same page, is that if you are seated and socially distanced, you can take your mask off, right? So if you feel comfortable, you don't have to. But if you're seated and there's, you, there's nobody around you, you can spread your arms out, then you can take your mask off. And, and, and we allow you to do that these days. Uh, however, at the 8.30 service, starting next Sunday, we're going to have masks through the entire thing. Um, and um, we're going to honor our senior adults that way. And um, they'll be able to, to worship uh, more fully in that way. So just know those are coming. And then also next week, uh, watch for We are going to begin to open Sunday school as well. And so with, with socially distanced and with um, all of our qualifications to make sure that we're doing that safely, but you need to be in contact with your, if you want to be here next week, with your Sunday school director, your Sunday school teachers, we're going to begin to open that slowly as well. Now, we're still going to have Zoom and online classes, and you all have done just remarkably well on Zoom Sunday school. That will remain, but we are, are going to start allowing uh, some um, be able to carefully come back to Sunday school um, you know, with your social dis distancing and all the things that we need to do there. So, so watch for that this week as well. So those are some changes that are coming. Um, we think this is the best way forward this week um, for next Sunday. And um, we trust the Lord with them. Now, in two weeks, all that could change again. We have no idea what's ahead. But those are going to be... Um, our hope and the way we're going to push forward for next Sunday. So um, pray with us through those things. Help us walk that direction. Um, we think it's going to be good, and we think it's going to be a good time together. So with those things said, let's leave next Sunday in the future, and let's come in to today. And, and let's pray that God brings us into his presence 
to a beautiful moment of worship together this morning. So let, let's pray in that way. Father, you are good and gracious. And, and God, you have taken care of us every step of the way. For 234 days, you have taken care of us. You have protected us. Lord, you have protected this church. And we praise your name for that. It is not a thing that we have done that has protected us. It only has been because your hand is with us and that your hand has protected us. And Lord, we ask that it would remain. And so, Lord, we come now to worship, and as we come to worship you, we, we recognize that it is it, it's you that's in control, that at your voice the, the earth shakes, and that, that at your voice, in an instant, Lord, you could stop this virus. And, Lord, we pray that it would be so today, that may you find the mercy in your heart. Lord, would you come and, and heal us and heal this land. And Lord, until, until you do, we're going, to, we're going to wait upon you and we're going to wait upon your answers and we're going to wait upon your healing. And Father, we are, we are just going to worship. And Lord, that's what we know to do and we're going to cry out to you. And Lord, we're going we're gonna to beg you to come. And so Lord, would you move in this place this morning? Would your spirit settle on this church wherever we find ourselves? And Lord, that we could experience you this morning. Fill our hearts up with your spirit that we are joyful and hopeful. And Lord, that we would meet today with an excitement that could only come because we know you. And so Lord, come, fill our worship with your spirit and be blessed by our singing. It's in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Say amen if you love the Word of God. Amen. I hope that you have found time this week to be in the Word every day to find time to, to just open it up and ask the Lord to reveal to you what He has for you this day. Um, as we've been in, continue to be in Philippians, I want you to hear this passage from Romans and, and you can certainly see how Paul has not changed in his message that he's talking about the resurrection and what that means if we, we live for Christ, to die for Christ and, and everything in between. So you follow along now as, as I read Romans 8, 12 through 17. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. So thankful for the word of the Lord. Our hymns this, this, this morning remind us that we are also standing at a really unique time, the end of October, the beginning of November. We, we remember the, the, the story of the Reformation and, and how we as a church um, really stand with our, 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 our brothers and sisters who have, have walked that path and so much of, of who, what we believe has come from that. Um, so we sing a mighty fortress is our God. Um, and then we'll, we'll also recognize that, that we receive our faith because God used individuals, whether it be a Sunday school teacher or your mom, your dad, your, your grandfather, a best friend. And we are so thankful for those saints that have poured into us. And so as we worship today, I want you to, to thank God for, for all the ways that he has provided for us to know him and to know him fully. But let's stand now and sing, A Mighty Fortress is Our God.
Good morning. It's so good to see you as we come to this time where we have our children's sermon. And today, I hope you saw the very beginning of the service because we want to talk about baptism. In fact, if you want to have something to draw this morning, maybe you should draw baptism. You could draw yourself getting baptized or Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist in the river. So maybe you can draw either one of those. But I do want to draw your attention to baptism because I want to make sure that we understand it clearly because we have another baptism next week. And so I hope you remember how this goes and why we do baptism. Because sometimes it looks like, and sometimes we think, that the baptism is what starts our relationship with God. Or we don't have a relationship with God till we're baptized, or we can't pray until we're baptized, or we, we, can't, um, we can't be near God until we're baptized. And, and that's a little backwards, that, that's not true. Usually what this, mean, or what this means for us is when somebody comes to a new relationship with Jesus, where they start to understand who Jesus is and they start to ask questions and they're ready to follow Jesus and they make that commitment in their life to say, I'm gonna follow Jesus wherever he goes. And then we say, well, let's follow him first in baptism. So this is a sign, so you saw these two today, Vlad and Stephen, that they've already started their relationship with Jesus. And some of their first acts of obedience to him is to be baptized. And so we do that from week to week and here in this place. And maybe it's time for for you to maybe have that conversation with your parents about what it means to be baptized and what it means to have a relationship with Jesus. Because whenever you're ready, and whenever any of you are ready to, to begin to follow Jesus Christ, then we'll be ready to baptize you too. And so we look forward to that day. We look for the day that all of you and, and all the children of this church are baptized. But we always wait. And so we wait on God to work on your life until, until God has started that work and you're ready to follow him and you're ready to make that decision for yourself because nobody else can make it for you. It's not a decision that, that your parents can make for you or your grandparents can make for you or your friends can make. This is between you and God. And whenever you're ready to follow Jesus and whenever you're ready to make that commitment, then it'll be time for your baptism. And I can't wait. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you for these beautiful examples of baptism. And Lord, we pray that uh, we would have many more, that the baptistry would be full because men and women alike are committing their lives to you and that will follow you anywhere that you lead. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. I love this hymn because it's joyful and triumphant. Music's written by my favorite composer. It's just, there's lots that I love about this hymn. But it also, the text reminds us that we stand on the shoulders of giants. That, that those people that have been in our lives that have told us who Jesus is. And guys, and they, don't, they don't have to be named Saint anything. They're, they're my fifth grade Sunday school teacher, Ken White, who was patient with me. <laughs> and he told me who Jesus was truly. And it was people like Pastor Paul McKim who, who showed by his integrity what it meant to live a life as a man who chased after Jesus. Who are those people in your life? Did they sit in this room? Did they sit under this dome? Or are they people that have passed on to their reward? Or, or are they here? It's never a wrong time to tell those people you're grateful for the influence that they've had on you. And we celebrate that. We should celebrate that because you're going to be that person for somebody. You may have my daughter in, in VBS. You may have one of my girls in, in, in Sunday school. And they may think back on in days to come that you were the one that, that told them the truth of Jesus. Friends, aren't you grateful for those people? Let's, let's be those people to, to, to those children sitting around us today. Let's stand up, everybody, for all the saints.
Amen. Choir, we miss you. Now, if you would, maybe find on your listening sheet or turn in your scripture, we're going to read aloud Philippians 3, uh, 7 through 11. So as you find that, would you stand with me? This, then, is the text for today. But whatever things were gained to me, these things I have counted as loss because of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in the view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them mere rubbish, so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if somehow I may attain. For yourself. What are you going to come up with on your own behalf? Because most everyone, everyone around us, everyone who's ever walked the face of this earth answers that question in about the same way. And in fact, it's the same argument that these Judaizers that the Apostle Paul is dealing with, it's what they would come in and torment him with. They would come in and they would torment the early church with. You know, it's something like this. This is the best line of thinking that we can come up with. We're, we're standing on trial in a grand celestial courtroom. And we walk towards the throne and we're just fumbling through all of our files. And, and as we fumble through our files, we begin to pull out the standards that we've always held in high regard in our own minds. And so we fumble through and we stand before the throne and we say something like this, well, I went to church every Sunday. Most every Sunday that we were in town, and m most every Sunday that we all felt, well, we were there. And then we say, and most of those Sundays we took the kids to Sunday school. That's a, that's a strong one, that's a good one. And we gave, at least in the good years, it, it, the good times we gave, and that one time we, we gave to a campaign. We gave what we could. Oh, and there are other things. I've, I've always tried to make sure that I was honest with people. I've tried to make sure that I was honest in business. In fact, there was, there was this one time there was a contract before me. And I knew there was a mistake in my favor. And, and I, t I told them that they, they might want to reevaluate it from their end. 
And we all know that my partners wouldn't have done that. I stepped up and was honest when they wouldn't have been. You know, these are the best kinds of things that we can come up with on our own. That's the pinnacle of it for us. And, and in fact, it's, it's not just us. These are the very same kinds of things that human religions have taught for thousands of years. I mean, this kind of list is humanity's best effort to encroach on the divine. And it is pathetic. You know, some people genuinely believe and they genuinely teach that the best shot at holiness is for you to find your one or two most polite moments in your life and just bask in that. There, there are others that, that, that genuinely believe and, and they act like their salvation depends on whether or not they can find somebody in this world who is worse than them. That there are people who will, will stand before the throne of God at the end of time and say, I was better than them. I was better than that guy. And we truly live like if I can find somebody who has lived this life worse than I have, then I must be okay. That must mean that, mean that I am good. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not as bad as they are. And when these are our arguments, it is pathetic. It won't work. That, that's not what the Word of God teaches. Right. That's not what the church teaches. That's not who we are. That's not where we find our salvation. You know, there were these, these kinds of what we call now Judaizers uh, in the early church with Paul and what they would teach. So Paul in, in many, start, started many churches in the ancient world. So he would go and he would, he would plant a church and it would be planted in the gospel. And there would be these others that would come in after him and there would be uh, devout Jewish Christians. And they would come in and tell the church, they'd say, well, well Paul gave you the beginning. This is the, there's more. And in fact, what you need to do next then, and the next step on the way to salvation is to essentially become Jewish. Where you need to, even as adults, become circumcised. You need to start following the kosher food laws, you know, like not eat pork, those kinds of things, and then you're made right with God. And so Paul brought the gospel to the church as the Holy Spirit led him to, and these false teachers, he calls them dogs then in verse 2, these dogs and false teachers would come in and say, well, that, that's not enough. The gospel is good and well, but, but let's go ahead and add what needs to be added. He said, you, you need to know this is the beginner version. There's more. And they just start adding burdens on the church. It's the gospel and. It's the gospel in this. It's the gospel in that. It's the gospel plus all of these other burdens that they wanted to place on the church. So they said you had to do all of these kinds of good deeds. And essentially you had to become Jewish to enter heaven. So let's say this clearly this morning. There is no such thing as the gospel and. There's nothing after that. It's, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ alone. There's nothing else that goes with it. There's nothing else to add to it. This is not the beginner version. This is the eternal version. And if anyone ever adds anything to the gospel of Jesus Christ, they have created a false gospel. And we need to call it what it is. And so we stand before the throne. We stand before the throne and we plead our case at the end of time. And to sum it all up, Your Honor, we went to church. We took care of the kids. I tried to be honest at work. I, I took my sister-in-law a casserole when my brother died. It, I, I, you know, we didn't follow the kosher food laws, but, you know, your servant Paul told us we didn't have to. And in conclusion, I have 2,578 charitable giving receipts to submit as my final evidence that I'm okay. And so ends our defense of ourselves. Those are the kinds of things that we come up with on our own to justify spending eternity in the presence of a pure and holy God. And it's laughable. It doesn't work. You know, Christ may be standing there kind at first. You know, Chris, you, you forgot about that time you helped the little boy that fell off his bike. Or, you know, Chris, you, you did help for one day on the mission trip. But listen. When you are standing before eternity, we're not dealing with the greatest hits of your life. You don't get to cherry pick the, the top 10 moments of the last 70 years of your life. 
But unfortunately, this is, this is how we think of the final judgment. We think we're going to be able to stand in the end and pull out a list of the ten best things we've ever done and lay them before the throne of God and say, I think that's enough. But we're, we're thinking about it all wrong. That, that's, that's not how it works. In fact, it's the exact opposite of how it works. You see, Scripture tells us plainly that neither God nor His dwelling tolerates sin. So much so that a single sin is incompatible with heaven. And with one stain of sin on her life, we are separated from God. And it isn't that God doesn't want you there. God does. But when we commit sin, we're declaring war on God and choosing to be separated from Him. You know, that's why our, our ten good deeds aren't enough. And you're, you're never going to be able to do enough good deeds to cover the stain of sin on your life. It's, it's not possible. And so when we plead our case of goodness in heaven's courtroom, it actually goes a different direction. And in fact, the Lord begins to speak and begins to recite our sin to be judged, all of it. Every poor decision we've ever made, every word spoken, an emotional outburst, every lustful thought. Frankly, God will not have to go past the very first time we were willfully disobedient. And at that first indiscretion, we are guilty. We're disqualified from heaven and punished in hell. It's, it's, it's that and it's over. You are guilty. It's, I know. I get it. It's impossible. It's impossible even for the best of us to enter into heaven on our own merit. You know, amazingly, in our text for this week, when we get to uh, Philippians 3, 5, and 6, the Apostle Paul goes after these Judaizers. And, and this is the way he does it. He says, if, if you want to talk about resumes... Let me just tell you something. My resume is better than any of your resumes. And so Paul, Paul takes the argument in this direction. He's saying, if, if you want to talk about resumes, I have a good a resume and as strong a Jewish pedigree as any one of you. And this is what I know. None of it matters. None of us are going to make it on our own into heaven. None of us have a resume good enough to get into heaven. He says there's another way. Now, look down with me. Let's look at Philippians 3, and I'm, I'm going to read uh, 5 through 11. So, let's, let's look at that together. So, you start in verse 5. This is where Paul jumps in. He says, if you want to talk about confidence in resumes, l listen to my resume. So, ver verse 5. A circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, which is found in the law, found blameless. But, then we get to verse 7, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. And more than that, I count all things to be lost in the view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ." and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ Jesus, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Do you, do you hear what he's saying here? The, the resume doesn't matter. In fact, your past doesn't matter. The good deeds don't matter. That God loved you so much that he sent his son for you that you might have a way out because it is impossible for you. What you need to understand this morning, it's impossible and, and we are nothing. But God loved you so much that long before you could ever comprehend it, God knew that you needed his grace and he's offering you a way out through his son, Jesus Christ. And, and the way of the word is that if only you would repent and believe in Jesus Christ, then you will be saved. You see, that's the gospel. There's no amount of good that you can do. Our call is to repent and believe. And when we repent and believe, we are saved. And that is it. You see, in the most gracious act ever bestowed on humanity, God said for a second time, anyone covered by the blood of the Lamb will be spared his judgment. You know, it's, so, it's, it's like in Exodus 12. If you think back to the book of Exodus, when the nation of Israel is coming out of Egypt, 
there's this powerful moment that's pointing us to Jesus Christ. He says there, the, the angel of death is coming down upon Egypt. And God says to those that are obedient to his children, he says, you take a lamb and you, you cover the, the doorpost with the blood of the lamb. And everybody who is under by the blood of the lamb, everybody who's covered by the blood of the lamb, they will be passed over. And in fact, they, they will be spared of the judgment that is coming down upon this nation. And it's just like this, and, and it's just like this at the end, that anyone who accepts the blood of Jesus Christ will be passed over during the judgment and offered new life in Jesus Christ. That if you will accept Christ and his blood, and that blood is marked over your life, then you're spared. Then you're spared of your sin, and you're spared of the judgment you deserve, not because you are good, but because of what Christ did on the cross. So that when we stand in the God of Angel Army's courtroom, we don't have to fumble through files of former deeds. All we have to say is that Jesus Christ is Lord, and I have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, by the blood that was shed on the cross. And with, with Christ at our side, he will say, it is so. He is one of mine. She is one of mine. They are redeemed because they're with me, with Christ. Not because of anything we've done, but because of everything that he did, everything that he's doing because he went to the cross on our behalf. And so my righteousness is not of my own merit. It's not because I keep the law. My righteousness is not because I'm good. I am made right with God because Jesus Christ is good. And I'll follow him wherever he leads me to go. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you. And we're grateful for your truth, and Lord, we are grateful that it is not on our own merit that we are made righteous. Lord, because we, we know when we sit here and we're honest with ourselves, not a single one of us measures up. And so we praise your name for your grace. And Lord, we pray that together in worship this morning, you would help us to better understand that grace and experience that grace and know you intimately. And so, Lord, in this time, as, as we gather together, would you work and move in our hearts and, and break into the hardness of our being and, and make it right? Lord, draw us into you so that we might be saved. And it's in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So this is your time now to respond. And in the moment, we're going to have uh, our orchestra has a recorded piece. They're going to play for us. And as the orchestra plays, I'll be on this side. Brian will be down on this side. Um, you're welcome to come forward and pray. You're welcome to, to visit with us about being a part of this church or accepting Christ. Um, but this is your time to be obedient unto the Lord. You'll also notice on the bottom of your listening sheet, um, there's, some, there's some ways you might respond to God there as well. But in this time, let's be obedient and let's commit to the Lord. And so with that, let's respond.
So today we also think about our brothers and sisters across the world who are suffering persecution simply for proclaiming the name of Jesus. So on this day of, of international prayer for the persecuted church, I want you to take a moment and watch this video and then Pastor Chris will come and, and we will pray. My name is Jeanette. I am a Christian and I love Jesus with all my heart. I love my children and I love the people of my country, the Central African Republic. There are both Christians and Muslims in my country and we lived as neighbors as I worked to reach them for Christ. But my hope for a peaceful life didn't last. Our village was ambushed by the Islamist attackers guns started firing and we started running as fast as we could into the bush. All the Christians in my village were killed or driven into hiding. I fled with my children. We didn't even have time to put on our shoes or clothes. Attacks like these have been targeting Christians in the Central African Republic for eight years and continue today. Churches and missionary stations that have been built over decades have been destroyed along with Christians' homes that have been burnt to the ground. In one area, the only structures that remained were the metal roofs of two churches. Thousands of Christians have spent years in makeshift temporary shelters far from their homes as the violence and instability